So I'm a teacher seven, Mr. Barry here. This is lesson number two or day number two for the computer literacy course. And today we'd be going over PC terms, setting up your free Google account, using Google's classroom, and getting to know your Google Drive. So let's get started with the lesson. Okay, I would like you now to go ahead and open up our books and turn to lesson two there in class. We're going to start off with parts that make up a computer system. The computer is made up of, from a system or a group of hardware components that work together towards a common end. In this lesson, we will look at these parts for a better understanding of what these devices actually do. First off, let's look at the monitor. Monitors are an essential part of a complete computer system. LED, LCD monitors are now the standard for the monitor type used. The advantages of LED LCD monitors are many. They use a tenth of the electrical power. They are also easier on your eyes and they weigh much less than the older CRT types. There are even curved monitors out now that have a curved screen. A 22 or 23 inch screen is normally large enough for everyday chores such as email, online shopping and document creation. However, screen sizes of 24 inches and larger are better suited for working with graphics and multimedia. The CPU or central processing unit acts like the computer's brain. It handles the calculations and logic which cause the computer to behave in a certain manner. Processors work according to a clock that beats a set number of times per second, normally measured in gigahertz. For instance, a 3.5 gigahertz processor has a clock that beats 3.5 billion times per second. Other factors that affect the process of performance include system memory or RAM, the operating system as well as other factors like the chipset and bus speed. The two main companies which make CPUs are AMD and Intel. Each has its own advantages and disadvantages. AMD CPUs tend to have a lower cost while Intel's tend to have better performance. The computer case, also known as the computer chassis, tower, system unit, or even base unit, is the enclosure that contains most of the components of your computer. Keyboard and mouse. As mentioned in lesson number one, these are the main input devices on most computers that allow you to use the computer and input information. The saucers are here to point out special notes for you, so whenever you see one, pay attention to what he is pointing out for you because at the end of the chapter I'll be asking questions. Data storage is next. Computers store data on hard drives or solid state drives. This data includes the operating system, apps and files. This is the same as you storing your writings in a notepad. These devices are found within the computer case. The capacity or amount of data these devices can store varies considerably. This capacity is measured in GB or gigabytes and in TB or terabytes. One gigabyte is a very large space. If you're only working with text, it's about a billion characters. A one GB or gigabyte of space can hold over 4,000 high quality photos. A terabyte is about a thousand gigabytes. Data is stored on hard drives and other media as ones and zeros or on and offs which we call binary. Just one one or zero place marker is called a bit. When eight bits are together, they form a byte, which can make a character. About a thousand bytes make a kilobyte. About a thousand kilobytes make a megabyte. About a thousand megabytes make a gigabyte. About a thousand gigabytes make a terabyte. Cloud storage. There is now a trend to store more information on cloud-based storage, which means saving data on secured web drives. An example of cloud storage is Google Drive. Data stored within your Google Drive is backed up or synchronized onto your Chromebook or computer, so you can actually access this information even when the device is offline. System Memory or RAM RAM or random access memory is used by the computer's brain, the CPU, to store information to complete specific tasks. It works like your brain's memory and allows the CPU to access frequently used information in a timely manner. The more RAM within a computer system, the better the performance of that computer will be. 
Most Windows PCs sold in 2017 had 8 gigs or more of RAM. Printers. Remember, printers can be added to your Google account so that you can print to your printer no matter where you are located. Printers are normally connected to the computer by a USB or universal serial bus cable, but many printers now are wireless. There are two main types of printers. These are laser and inkjet. Lasers tend to be cheaper to run in the long run, but may cost more than inkjets at the checkout. When you register a printer to your Google account, you have access to that printer no matter where you are logged into your Google account. This means that you can print those holiday pictures while you are still on holiday. This is because apps, photos, printers and your social media are now connected to your Google account, not to any specific computer or mobile device. Modem A modem is a device that connects the computer with the internet and Wi-Fi router. The Wi-Fi router is a device that provides a wireless access point to the internet that it receives from the modem. Let's turn now to page number 3. Software Terms When the computer is turning on or booting up, it will normally show a splash screen. The splash screen is one way to tell which operating system the computer is using. Operating System The operating system is the software which runs the computer and dictates the behavior of the device. Each operating system allows the user to change the desktop picture and alter other appearance to their liking. As newer operating systems are released, they normally include more features, require higher hardware specifications, and tend to be easier to use. Every OS has some sort of start menu, which is where the user starts and finds the applications. Screen resolutions Screen resolutions means the way that the monitor paints the picture of your work. The numbers that are used in screen resolutions reflect the number of pixels or dots that make up the screen image. For example, a screen resolution of 800 by 600 means there are 800 columns and 600 rows of dots that make up your screen. Larger monitors can show larger screen resolutions with better clarity than smaller monitors. This is the typical view of a 24 inch LCD monitor at a screen resolution of 1920 by 1200. Higher screen resolutions produce smaller screen objects but larger screen areas. And smaller screen resolutions produce larger screen objects but smaller screen areas as seen in these three pictures. Pro tip how to change the screen resolution to make it easier to see small text on the screen. First off, let's go over Windows 7, 8 and 10. First step is to right click on the desktop. This will bring down a menu. Click on the display settings as seen here. Next select resolution from the menu. And then you can select the screen resolution that you wish to use or you may actually change the scale to cause the text to appear larger on your screen. Now if you're using a Chromebook or a Chrome OS, you click on the user's icon which is found in the lower right hand portion of the screen near the time as seen here. Next the control menu should open. Click on the gear icon found here. The settings window will open. Key in displays in the search box found here and then select displays as seen here. The display options window should appear as seen here. Select the screen resolution that you wish to use by sliding the resolution selection bar either to the left or right. There is normally one dot where it actually says best or recommended. Another option is to zoom into the text. You can use the shortcut control and the plus key to zoom in or you can use control and the minus key to zoom out. Let's turn to page 5. Here is a comparison of two different screen resolutions on the same size screen. The first one shows a screen resolution of 1920 by 1080. The second one shows a screen resolution of 2400 by 1350. Notice as the screen resolution goes up, the size of the text and images goes down. 
Another way to change the size of text on a web page is to use the shortcut Control Plus or Control Minus. When you press and hold the Control key and then tap the Plus key, the text will become larger. To go the other way, Control Minus will cause the text to appear smaller. Let's now look at setting up a free Google account. Having a Google account has many benefits. A user may check their email by any computer that is connected to the internet. A Google account allows the user to create and edit documents within Google Docs without having to install any other software besides the Chrome browser. It also allows users to save their documents, pictures, music, and movies in a special online storage called Google Drive. It has built-in virus protection and security. Also, it will never have a cost for the free account. So let's see what you can get with the Google account. Well, there's many of their own apps as you can see here, but there's literally thousands of apps in the Chrome Web Store. Hangouts is for free calling. With it, you can use your computer to actually make phone calls. You can even do video calls. So what is a Chromebook? A Chromebook is a laptop that runs the Chrome OS, making it run fast and secure. It even runs many of the applications offline. So which Chromebooks are best to buy in 2020? Google publishes expiration dates for Chromebooks on their auto update policy page. But rather than browse down into each Chrome OS device maker's page to find out if one particular Chromebook was expiring, I compiled a quick list of every single device and then sorted them out by their expiration dates. 51 Chromebooks have expired dates, meaning that they will not receive any updates for their hardware, software, or security. Another 35 have only one year left to support. 29 Chromebooks have two years of life left and another 13 with about three years. Frankly, that's quite a bit of Chromebooks you could potentially purchase that will no longer get updates very soon after you buy them. All told, not counting the already expired Chromebooks, there's 77 I think you may want to avoid right now. They are listed below, followed by the newer Chromebooks that I would recommend. Now, just because a Chromebook doesn't receive any updates doesn't mean that it doesn't turn on or doesn't work for you any longer. It simply means that it will no longer be receiving security updates. All right, now the list is very, very long. And what you can do is you can actually pause the screen if you're looking for a particular Chromebook and you were looking for a particular model. You could pause the screen here and then uh, browse through these. But these are the one Chromebooks that have already expired and will no longer receive any updates. So here's the first part. And here are others that expired in the early part of 2020. Now these right here will be expiring in late 2020. These Chromebooks are expiring in 2021. So there's your list there. Again, remember you can always pause by hitting the space bar and then to replay or resume, hit that space bar again. Chromebooks expiring in 2022 are listed here. So these I have them listed in yellow, meaning eh, there's not very much life left, but it's possible you might still buy these. These Chromebooks are expiring in 2023. And these Chromebooks are expiring in 2024. Right away, I notice mine is right there. This is the one that I recommend, or I have recommended for many years. And it's the Acer Chromebook 15, the CB515-1H. That's the one that I currently use.
These are also expiring in 2024. Now we get into the green area. These would be on my recommended list because these Chromebooks expire in 2025, giving you about four and a half years of good life. These are in late 2025, so that gives you a full five years. These Chromebooks are expiring in 2026. And you can see there's a long list there for the 2026 models. Now, if you were looking for the newest Chromebooks, here they are. These Chromebooks have expiration dates that are 2027 or later. So we see the Dell Latitude 7410 Chromebook. And these others here, the other variants. These are in 2028, such as the Acer Chromebook 712. Here's another one. Acer Chromebook Spin, the 311. Acer Chromebook Spin 713. So any of these that I have highlighted here would be recommended Chromebooks if you want the longest life. This next section is for my students who do not yet have a Google account. If you already have a Google account, you can go ahead and skip all the way to page seven. Step number one, to receive your free Google account, open a program to go out onto the internet, such as Google Chrome. Step number two, go to www.google.com if you're not already there. Now this can be done by keying in the word Google into the address box and then pressing the shortcut Control Enter on your keyboard. You do this without the quotation marks as seen here. Step number three, click on the blue sign in icon found within the top right hand corner of the page that looks like this. Step number four, the page will change the one that is shown here. Step five, if you do not have a Google account, click on create an account. Now if you already have a Google account, you can actually sign in now. And then sit back and relax while those who do not have a Google account create one now. So once you have clicked on create an account, this page will open up where it says create your Google account. Click over where it says your first name and type in your first name and you can use the tab key to jump to the next cell and type in your last name. And when it says choose your username, you will have to choose a unique email. So you can use your name with some numbers, that's actually quite common. And then create a password. Now there's some tricks for having a password that you can remember. You can use things and objects that you already are familiar with, such you can use names, phone numbers, or even places and all those can be combined into make a nice good password. Then you can put in your birth date and follow the on-screen instructions. Remember, never forget your Google username or password. Please write them down in your book. Also, adding a mobile phone number allows you to log into your Google account even if you forget your password. After entering all of this information, your account will be ready. Now I've provided a little space in your book where you can write down your username and your password. You can log into your Google account on multiple devices to access your photos, documents, music and other files which is private and only accessible by you because it is protected by your password. This means that documents created on your Chromebook may be accessed on your smartphone or even on your Windows machine. Also documents and other files are automatically saved for you within your Google Drive. Now once you have a Google account and you're logged in, you'll notice a few things over in the upper right hand corner when you go to google.com. The first thing you might notice is it says Gmail. This link connects you with your email. Another one that we see is the Chrome apps. Now this link connects you with all of your apps. 
the little bell, that's the notification. And the last one is your account settings. So you can actually get any of your account information or change things in there with that icon. In this next segment, I'm going to show you how to use the video and do your work at the same time. Now these tricks, with these shortcuts, they work great if you have a large screen such as a 24 inch screen to do your work on. When you have a smaller screen that's less than 11 inches, it does become a little challenging. Now, if you press the F key with your video is up, it will it'll make it into full screen. And if I press it again, it makes it back into the box video. Now I can use a shortcut flag arrow key to cause my video to fall onto one side of the screen. And that would be the flag and then the arrow key such as to the right and it makes the video fall to the right. I can open up my Google Drive and then drag it out so I'm dragging it out and then I use the same shortcut but this time I'm going to go to the left. So flag to the left arrow key and now I have my Google Drive on one side and I can have my other work here. So in this case, I'm going to have my video up and playing on this side. So now I can do my work and watch the lessons and the steps at the exact same time. Now this can also be done within the Google Meet. So if you're doing Google Meet, you can also do the same trick with the flag and the arrow keys. Now those tricks are, are working on a Windows computer. If you have a Chromebook, the shortcut is alt bracket so you have the alt left bracket if you want to work with stuff on the left hand side and it's alt right bracket if you want the window to be working on the right hand side so now you notice I have the video working here and I have my work over here now for my students who are using Mac computers you can use two Mac apps side by side in what's called split view with Split View, you can fill your Mac screen with two apps without having to manually move and resize each of the windows. So it'll look something like this, with the video running on one side and you work on the other side of your screen. Now the steps differ slightly based on which Mac OS you're using. If these steps don't work, simply choose Apple Menu and go to your System Preferences. Then click on Mission Control and make sure that displays have separate spaces is selected. Now, for Mac OS Catalina, one, hover your pointer over the full screen button that's found in the upper left-hand corner of your window, or click and hold the button. Number two, choose the tile window to the left screen or tile window to the right of screen from the menu. The window will then fill that side of the screen. For other Mac OS versions, one, Click and hold the full screen button in the upper left hand corner of the window. Two, as you hold the button, the window shrinks and you can drag it to either the left or the right side of the screen. Three, release the button, then click a window on the other side of the screen to begin using both windows side by side. Now what we do within the Google Drive, starting next time there, lesson three, we'll get into the Google Drive, we'll be clicking on new, going down to Google Docs and then working within our Google Docs there. Now at any time you can always click on the maximize button here at the very top and you'll maximize your work so you can see all of your tools if you need to. If you want to go back to being small again you can click that same icon but this time it's called restore down and then I'm going to use the flag arrow key and it'll force it over to the left hand side. By using these shortcuts you can do your work on one side of the screen and watch the class on the other side of the screen. Let's now turn to page 8. Clicking on the Google Apps icon opens a menu showing some common apps. So go ahead and do that now. One of the icons that you should see would be the red one that shows the YouTube videos. We also have the Google Hangouts. This is for free phone and video calling. Then we also see one here. It's called the Google Drive. This is the one place to find your documents and other files. And then another one is the calendar. With Google Calendar you can quickly schedule meetings or events and get reminders about upcoming activities so you always know what's next. We also have Gmail. Of course this is your email. And then Photos. 
This is Google Photos and it automatically organizes and sorts out all of your photos for you. Then we have Play. The Play Store has many apps that run on your newer Chromebooks and smartphones. Another one that we have is the Classroom. Google Classroom allows you to access these lessons. Next topic. Let's go on to the introduction of the Google Classroom. Google Classroom is a free web service developed by Google for schools that aims to simplify creating, distributing, and grading assignments in a paperless way. So let's find this app. Number one, open the Google Apps icon found at google.com. Number two, click on the Google Classroom. Now you may need to click on the More link to show the Google Classroom icon on the second page. Let's go to page nine. Number three, the Google Classroom homepage should load as seen here. Number four, click on the plus to reveal more options as seen here. Number five, click on join class. Number six, key in the class code that starts with AYW that's found on the last part of your book. I will give you this specific code depending on which classroom that you're in and then you click on the join button. Now for my YouTube audience, key in the code 54OMY2 to join my class. Let's now turn to page 10. Step number seven. My computer literacy classroom should load as seen here. Number eight, you may receive helpful tips the very first time that you use Google Classroom. You may read these tips and then click got it to close them. Number nine, your classroom may look like one of these depending on which class that you've joined. Let's now turn to page 11. Step number 10. You may click on any of the assignments to view those. To watch a video, simply click on the one that you wish to view. It will open into a new window as seen here. Number 11. Once the video lesson opens, you may then click on the YouTube button, normally found at the bottom of the video, to watch the video in YouTube, where you can add comments, rate the video, or even share the video. Number 12. We will be using Google Classroom every day to help you find each lesson. Next topic, introduction to Gmail. Number one, click on Gmail to read your mail. If this is the first time that you've ever used Gmail, it will open to a window like this. Number two, you may click on the blue next, OK or got it buttons to close off those messages. Let's turn to page 12. Step number three, your email should load into a page like this one. Step number four, before going on, let's learn the different icons used within Gmail. The first one that we see here is create for creating your new email. Then we have our email folders. Then we have the primary email folder, the social email folder, and the promotional emails. To open an email that has been sent to you, click on its subject or its title. Hey, we have a pro tip. You can organize your incoming mail into folders by using the filters found within the settings. To forward that email, click on the three small dots found on the right side of the email and then select forward as seen here. Page 13. Gmail now has built-in tools to help you with your tasks. These tools are the calendar, the keep notebook, tasks, and the get add-ons. Each one of these opens up into a small sidebar as shown here. Page 14. Sending your first email. Number one, to send a new email, click on Compose. Number two, once you have clicked on Compose, a new window opens up in front of your work. Number three, key in the email address that I will give you in class. Now for those who are in my classroom, the email that I want you to send an email to is found on the last page of the book. Number four, click within the subject box 
and key in the word hello. Number five, click within the main message box of the email and key in a short message. This could be something as simple as, hello Mr. Barry or hey, how you doing today? Now, after you've keyed in the message, we're ready for step number six. For extra fun, you may drag and drop pictures or even text and video into the main message area of the email to insert those items into the mail. You may also use the tools found at the bottom of the email window to add elements to your email. Number seven, to change the text size, fonts, and colors, you may use the tool that looks like a capital A found at the bottom of the email window. Let's turn to page 15. Step number eight, after typing in a short message, click on the send button that can be found at the bottom of this window. Once you discover how to use Gmail, it can be a great deal of fun. Let's go on to the next topic, Google Drive. The Google Drive is the one place where you can store your documents, pictures, and other files securely. Google Drive in detail. Number one, if you're not logged into your Google account, log in now and go to a new tab within the Chrome browser. The new tab button is circled in red in this image. It is found towards the top of your screen. Number two, click on the Google Apps icon as seen here. Number three, the apps menu will load showing the apps that are installed in your account. Page 16. Step number four, click on the Google Drive icon. Step number five, the Google Drive app should load and look like this. Let's talk about the elements of that page. The first one we see would be the new button. This allows the user to create new folders, documents, and a host of other types of files. It also allows the user to upload files. The next one says My Drive. This area is where users see and can access their files. Next one says Computers. This area allows the user to see the folders within their other computers. Another one we have is Shared With Me. This area allows the user to see all of the files that are shared with them from other users. Then we have Recent. This is the area that lists the files that were recently accessed by the user. We also see Starred. This area shows any files that have been starred by the user. Let's go on to page 17. First one we have there is Trash. This is the area that holds the user's deleted files until the trash is emptied. Next one we have is Backups. This shows which files have been backed up from the user's computers. Then we have the File View Options. This allows the user to change how the files appear within the drive. It's either a list view or a picture view. Then we have the Tools. This allows the user to change many of the options found within their drive. We are now going to make a new folder in your drive and organize all of your class work. Number one, from within the Google Drive, please click on the New button as seen here. Number two, click on the Folder option from the menu that drops down. Number three, the new folder dialog box should open as seen here. Step number four, key in Project Folder Fall 2018. We'll be needing to use the current year because these might be used in 2019 as well. You key all that into the box that's provided. Number five, after giving the new folder a name, click on the blue create button. Six, you will see the new folder appear within your drive as seen here. 7. Take your mouse and click once on the project folder which is in your drive. The folder will change color when you click once on it. 8. After clicking on the project folder, find the share icon. The share icon is located in the upper right hand portion of the drive. Step number 9. Click on the share icon now. 
Number 10. After clicking on the Share icon, the Share with Others window should open as seen here. Step number 11. Key in the address that I will give you in class. This is the address that I placed on the last page of the chapter or your book. Step number 12. Click on the blue Send button after keying in the email address. 13. After sharing the folder, double click the project folder to open it. The project folder will load showing that there are no files in it yet. What you've just created is a shared folder and any work such as documents or spreadsheets that you create within this one folder is automatically shared with your teacher. Now work that's created in other folders is not automatically shared. So it's a good way to share just your classwork with your teacher. Let's now turn to page 20. Your Google Drive comes with 15 gigs of free space. If you own a Chromebook, Google adds another 100 gigs of space to your drive. If you own an Android phone or tablet, Google adds another 15 to 30 gig of space for each device. Remember, Google Documents, Spreadsheets, Forms, and Presentations do not count against your drive space. We have done a great deal in this lesson, from learning the parts that make up a computer system to creating a Google account and using your Google Drive. I hope that you make time to review some of the content that we have went over today and log into your Google account at home. Now let's go on to the questions for lesson number two. If you are taking this class for credit, then take a sheet of paper, write your name along the top line. After answering these questions, please turn them in to Mr. Barry. Or you may go out and start a new email and send an email to selmateacher7 at gmail.com with your answers. Question number one, which monitor type uses the least amount of electricity? Number two, which monitor type has the most amount of eye strain? Number three, the CPU acts like a what? Question number four, the two main companies that make CPUs are what and what? Question number five. The what holds all of the devices together which allow the computer to work? Number six. The what and the what are input devices. Question number seven. 1,000 megabytes is one watt. Question number eight. RAM is short for what? Number nine, normally a computer has how many operating systems? Question number 10, booting means what? Question number 11. The Windows desktop picture can be changed. Is this true, false, or none of the above? Question 
Question number 12. Google Gmail is free. Question number 13. Documents, movies, pictures, and music can be stored with what? Is it A, the GoGo menu, B, the E drive, C, the Google drive, or D, none of the above? Number 14. You need to log into Google to retrieve your Google documents. Is this true, false, or none of the above? Question number 15. Google allows you to add printers to your account so that you can print to them regardless of your location. So you can print to your home printer even when you're away from home. Is this true, false, or none of the above? Question number 16. Google gives how much free space on your Google Drive? Question number 17. If you give a mobile phone number, they can call you if you forget your password. And this is regarding Google accounts. Is this true, false, or none of the above? Eighteen. The Compose button allows you to make new folders. Is this true, false, or none of the above? Question number 19. Forgetting both your Google username and password will make it very difficult to get into your account. Is this true, false, or none of the above? Question number 20. What is the name of this icon? Question number 21. The computer is made up from a system or what what? And this is a direct quote from a page in my book. Question number 22. Give one example of a cloud storage. Question number 23. The two main types of printers are what and what? Question number 24. Name the device that connects the computer with the internet. Question number 25. Name the device that provides a wireless access point to the internet that it receives from the modem. Question number 26. What does the operating system do? Question number 27. 
What is the shortcut to increase or decrease the size of text on a web page? Question number 28. Can you log into your Google account on multiple devices? Question number 29. Is your Google account private? Question number 30. Do you need to remember your Google username and password? Remember to bring your Google account information with you to class so that you can log into your account next time. Well, that concludes lesson number two for the Computer Literacy course. Thank you very much for watching the video and if you haven't done so, please subscribe. And when you subscribe, there's a little bell icon. Make sure you go ahead and click on that bell icon so that you actually be notified when new videos come out. Thank you again and bye-bye.